Alive and Well STL is a presentation of the St. Louis Regional Health Commission and Rare Gem Productions to build a healthier St. Louis. Power up with the positive. Learn more at onerarejem.com. That's O-N-E-R-A-R-E-G-E-M.com. The Regional Health Commission works in partnership with regional health sector advocates and stakeholders to improve health care access, reduce health disparities, and improve health outcomes for the uninsured and the underinsured in St. Louis City and County. Alive and well, STL. A powerful story of hope, resilience, and renewal from a man whose hope was all but lost. I believed I was a burden to everyone who loved me. Mm. I believed I was useless, worthless, completely less than... And I believe my family actually would be better off without me. So I never wanted to die. I only thought I had to. Suicide prevention and mental health advocate, award-winning global speaker, best-selling author, and documentary filmmaker Kevin Hines is with us on Alive and Well STL. We'll be right back. Let's just take five and address this stress. Do you feel pressured in many areas of your life and unable to complete things successfully? Do you find yourself crying all the time or unable to cry at all? Have you become more accident prone? Well, if you answered yes to two or more of these questions, you could use to reduce your stress. When we're experiencing too much lasting negative stress, we got to do something about it. The research is clear. Toxic stress is making us sick, but you can be alive and well. Find out more at Alive and Well. STL.com. Alive and well, STL. So Provident STL is bringing a phenomenal speaker to their annual gala. The story is powerful and a message that you will not want to miss. Kevin Hines survived a suicide jump from the Golden Gate Bridge several years ago. He's only one of a few to ever survive this jump. He wrote about his mental health journey, Cracked, Not Broken, and now speaks about mental health on a national level. Kevin, thank you for joining me today. Oh, I'm glad to. Thank you for having me. Sure. Well, let's let's start from the very beginning. Uh, where were you in your life? And what was that place that brought you to want to take your life? And then by jumping off of the Golden Gate Bridge. Well, uh, I actually never wanted to die by suicide. It's a very specific word, want, and... I actually came to a place in complete mental breakdown and instability because of my brain's functioning, because of bipolar disorder. I believed I had no other option but to die. I felt compelled to die. As a matter of fact, when I was on that that walkway, looking down into the waters below, um, I believed I was a burden to everyone who loved me. Mm. I believed I was useless, worthless, completely less than, and I believed my family actually would be better off without me. So I never wanted to die. I only thought I had to. Mm-hmm. And that was caused by brain disease. You know, we have every function of our body, right? I mean, our liver, heart, lungs, they can get diseased. And yet when things below the neck get diseased, people get right behind those people. They stand up for them. They tell them they can beat it. They can fight it. But tragically, when someone has a brain disease or what everyone calls a mental illness, a uh, brain health condition, um, it's, it's the organ in the body we neglect the most. Right. And people don't comprehend when someone suffers from an issue of the brain, how their whole lives can be destroyed. Mm-hmm. Um, and that's what led me to the Golden Gate Bridge, and frankly, that's what led me to jump off. Um, and the point, you know, I'm going to make today here at Provident is that the millisecond my hands went over that rail, I had an instant regret mm-hmm. that I just made the greatest mistake of my life and that I thought it was too late. I'm glad that you bring the point in that you didn't want to die by suicide. You felt like you had to. And that there's some clarity that needs to be made for all of us, for that matter, that what you may feel in the one moment cannot or should not be a permanent response that can affect how you may exist in the next. Yeah. Uh, you know, what I did had a ripple effect into everyone who ever knew me. How you so? Know, people, well, they, you know, Decades ago, the father of suicide prevention, uh, Edwin Schneider and Norman Farborough, uh, said that for every one death by suicide, six people are directly affected. Mm-hmm. And the new uh, uh, director of the American Association of Suicidology, Julie Sorrell, uh, has done a study, an empirical study that's defined that for every one person death died by, who dies by suicide, 115 people are affected uh, and some directly affected. But I, I actually put the point out that for every one death by suicide, the ripple effect from that one death 
can go on forever. Imagine if that person is a father to a two-year-old boy, Mm -hmm. and that two-year-old boy doesn't find out that his dad died by suicide until he's 12. And then when he finds out at 12, everyone around him knows what he found out. All of his friends are affected by how it's affected him. And when you look at a death by suicide and its insurmountable and incalculable effect on people, the, the hurt just goes on forever. You know, I'm very blessed here. I, I live from this terrible event. I survived. I'm very lucky to be alive, let alone to be anywhere. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I want to tell you something that I'm going to say in my speech today. I recently asked my father if he still fears my death by suicide. Now, granted, I have chronic suicidal thoughts. You I still have bipolar do. Disorder type, yeah, oh, yeah. I have bi- bipolar disorder type 1 with psychotic features. I have uh, paranoia, delusions, mania, hallucinations, auditory and visual, uh, depression. All of these things still come. What has changed is my ability to be self-aware with a brain disease. I know when the symptoms are happening, and I know what to do when they happen. And I've accepted 100% that I have this disease, so clearly I know how to fight it. Mm-hmm. I utilize steps every day to stabilize my mentality. Um, even though these things are going on, They'll never beat me. I'll never fall to suicide. I'll never die that way because I have the resilience that has built up over a long period of time, the last 15 years, mind you, uh, a a time when uh, I went up and down, back and forth, in seven psych wards with uh, with suicidal thoughts, um, had electroconvulsive therapy um, in 2011 for 26 treatments. Like, you know, this has seriously affected my life and everyone around me. Absolutely. And so it's not, it's, not, it's not always a one-time thing. And there are people all around the world who suffer chronic suicidal thoughts. Um, and we're trying, I'm trying to be a voice of, of that person saying, you can go on, you can fight. And people ask me, what about when you don't see hope? What mm-hmm. about when you can't see that it's there? And it used to be, you know, when that would happen, I'd spiral out of control. But today, when I can't see hope, which still happens, I tell myself, Kevin, it's there. You just have to keep moving forward. Mm -hmm. That's a message, again, for all of us, because I was going to address many of us have those feelings that we become a burden or that our life is burdensome and may not know how to respond or get to a place where we do feel hopeless. Mm. And then understanding that you have a disease that affects you. Many of us have varying levels of that that may not be diagnosable, but certainly many levels of feeling out, out of body, out of control and, and out of, out of hope. So your, your message and your encouragement to everyone else, anyone else, would be what when we find ourselves in that place, in that dark place? My and message is that when you find yourself in that place, in that you know pit of hell, your own personal hell, um, my message is this, that you can go on. Mm-hmm. That suicide doesn't need to end you. That's right. And that no matter the pain you experience today, yesterday, or tomorrow, uh, if you recognize that pain is real, and if you can be honest with the people in your direct circle, they can help keep you safe. Mm-hmm. My message is that none of us can battle this mental fight all by ourselves. I've tried that for way too long. It got me nowhere. Right. Um, you know, it, what got me to a safer place, even though I have all these things still happen, was fighting tooth and nail every day for my mental well-being. Mm-hmm. Fighting tooth and nail every day for good brain health. And utilizing things like education to my brain disease, exercise, good eating habits, and a great sleep pattern built Mm -hmm. over time. You know, I built my bricks of mental wellness over time. It didn't happen overnight. And, you know, know, in this society, I feel too often people want to turn to their phones, press a button, and make everything happen. But that's not how your brain works. And I think that if you just realize how important you are, how much you matter, how pertinent you are to the people around you, you can keep going. And once you get treatment for a mental illness, a brain disorder, you can heal. It takes time. It's an ongoing process. Like I said, I'm in recovery every single day, and that's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm okay with that because I get to be alive, and being alive is a privilege. And that's how I look at it today, and I hope that anybody listening 
who is battling this kind of pain right now can turn to the one that loves them the most and, and, and say, I need help. Right. I need it now. Right. And not only that, you're fighting for your life. And could you speak to the person who thinks that the end is the answer? To end it is the answer. You know, I'll give you a prime example. I've been on the phone and going over emails back and forth with a young man from Africa. And he wrote to me telling me he was going to end his life, telling me there was no other option that he'd be gone. And that was five days ago. And we are conversating, we're talking, we're emailing, we're getting information back and forth to one another so far apart. And all I'm trying to do is help keep him here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so, you know, it's a, it's a moment by moment thing sometimes. It's a day by day thing sometimes. If you're in that pit, that darkness, you have to reach out like he did. Mm -hmm. He reached out. He was going to die. He reached out. Five days later, he's still alive. Now, who knows what's going to happen in the coming days? Sure. But I'm going to do my best. I'm going to do my best uh, to keep reaching this young man and, you know, and, and keep him uh, keep him engaging and talking and writing so that, you know, he just gets alive that next day right. and that next day and that next day until he realizes how important and valuable he really is. What have the additional days afforded you and how has your life changed? It's, yeah, that, that's a great question. And, 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 you know, I hope I can share this interview with this young man because the additional days have uh, have given me uh, a new perspective on life, the ability to not take anything for granted, not one thing, not one person, not one place I go, because we, we, we take things too granted in our, in our lives. You know, we take the bridges we cross via car for granted because they've already been built, mm -hmm. but we didn't build them. They were built for us. We take the buildings that house conferences and the chairs that the audience sits in for granted. But someone built those chairs, someone placed them there so you could sit there, you didn't sweat on it yourself. We are only here but for those who have come before us. I believe that. Mm -hmm. And I have been granted the, the gift of a, a beautiful wedding to my wife, the woman of my dreams I've met mm -hmm. uh, and fell in love with and, uh, and married. Uh, and we've been together for 12 years, married for 10. And, you know, as they say, she is my reason for reason. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I, I've been granted the the beauty of uh, a wonderful new relationship with my father. Uh, he was the best man at our wedding, you know, and, and I've been granted the gift to see my brother go from 13 years of age to 25. Yeah. Wouldn't have, wouldn't have seen that. Or, or for anybody in my life for that matter, mm -hmm. for this long. And, and the gift of a of live life. you, yeah. The gift of a living you for them. Imagine your mm -hmm. brother, had he endured that. Yeah. And I'm sure it was challenging enough, but what a gift it is that you were given the chance to be here and you're using your life as a gift to, as a gift to others. No, I'm just, I'm, I just, I have to tell you, I mean it when I say how glad I am I'm, I'm alive and I know I can't reach everyone. I know I'm only one person, but I can be a tiny cog in the wheel, this field of suicide prevention, mental health, well-being, and try to try to reach someone, anyone, anywhere. Uh, choose choose a different path. Sure. Choose hope. Help us if we are the the ones that are called. If someone reaches out to us, help us respond. Certainly. You know, if you live in America, one of the first things you want to do is get the people next to you or near you. Um, if you're near someone, if you get a call that someone's in despair and they might be thinking of ending their life. First, call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline. Okay. And if you don't know what that is, that's 1-800-273-8255. Um, and, and what you want to do is call that number. And if you're an active duty military veteran, or, or uh, pardon me, active duty military or veteran, you, you call that number and you press 1 for the veterans hotline. They also have a chat line and other, other resources online at, at, uh, uh, <clears throat> at the suicide prevention lifeline.org. Um, you want to make sure that you have people in your corner helping you get the person in need to safety. Um, and, and the next thing is, if someone tells you they're contemplating this, take it seriously. Right. You know, whether it's used a lot of times or once, the, the words of I, I wish to die by suicide, you take it very seriously. 
because it is serious. It means they're thinking about it. Ask them if they have a plan. Mm-hmm. When they, if and when they tell you the plan, sit with that individual, pause everything else you're doing, and open your ears and listen. Oftentimes, all people really want is to be seen, meaning they want people to see their pain. They want people to see their struggle as real and not invalidate it. And they don't want to be judged and talked down to. They want to be uplifted and shown there's a new way. Mm-hmm. Um, and oftentimes when you ask a person who's, who's in a lot of pain, if they're thinking about suicide, it's not something that's going to put that in their mind if they're not already thinking about it. Frankly, if they're not already thinking about it, they're going to ask you to go away. But if they're mm-hmm. thinking about it, <laughs> they're going to see for the first time that a person around them saw them, really, really saw them for who they are and what they're going to and offered help. Yeah. All I ever wanted when I was on that bridge about to jump off was for one person to look at me and say, are you okay, kid? Hey, is something wrong? Can I help you? I had already made a pact with myself that if one person said that, I'd tell them everything wow. and beg for their help. Oftentimes, suicidal people are subconsciously looking for someone to see their pain, recognize it as true, and offer assistance. That's powerful. What about what can we do before the call? It sounds to me that many of us are feeling alienated and disconnected and uncared for and that we don't matter. Mm. And for me in my life, my commitment is to make every connection tangible. That even if it's just a smile, that it's going to matter from my heart, yeah. that I'm sending it to them from a sincere place. Or if yeah. I ask someone, how are they doing, that I'm really there to hear what their response is. What would you say is the thing we can do before the call for other people well, in, 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 our, in our lives? You, you just touched upon it. You, you, you said that uh, every person in your life matters, and, and what you do is you, when you ask them, how are you, you really care about the answer. I, I, I'm so glad you said that. I, I say this in every one of my speeches. All too often, this society, every society, will go up to the person, the people they know, the people they don't know, hey, how are you? Mm-hmm. And all they're waiting for is a good, okay, or fine. Mm. And they're not ready to listen to that answer. And so the people who respond to those questions from the everyday people around them usually say, okay, good, or fine, because they know that someone else is not ready to hear that they're having a terrible day or, or a wicked uh, mental health month or year. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so I think that's the point right there. You, you, you got it. Yeah. When you are interacting with people around you, get off your phone, yes. look people in the eye, and when they say they're having a bad day, instead of going, you know, I really have to get to that next meeting, sit down, hear them, really hear them. Don't just listen, hear them. Mm. Hear their pain and offer assistance in the form of a hug, a smile, yeah. an embrace, or all of the above. That's right. Show that you care um, and, and realize that, you know, every solution can't be found on an application on your iPhone. <laughs> Isn't that the truth? So glad for you and your life, Kevin, and that I have had the fortune to speak with you today. You have renewed and refreshed my spirit, and I'm grateful for your life today. Thank you very much, and I'm for yours the same. Mm. Kevin Hines is an award-winning global speaker, best-selling author, documentary filmmaker, suicide prevention, and mental health advocate who reaches audiences with his story of an unlikely survival and his strong will to live. God bless you, Kevin. (laughs) You can learn more at KevinHinesStory.com. That's KevinHinesStory.com. Provident STL will have Kevin here as their keynote speaker and I'm sure will empower many, many lives along the way. His book, Cracked Not Broken, can be found online. You can click there to purchase right there at KevinHindsStory.com. And again, we just are so thankful for you and appreciate your time and your life today, Kevin. Thank you very much. We're excited to have you join us with the Alive and Well STL movement. Alive and Well STL is now a community-wide effort focused on reducing the impact of stress and trauma on our health and well-being. The research is clear. Stress and traumatic experiences are making many of us sick and together are the leading cause of poor health outcomes. 
Take five. Visit us at aliveandwellstl.com to find out where you are emotionally. Become an ambassador. Reach out and help build a supportive community. Learn resiliency skills. Get the help you need. Share your stories. Hear others. And learn more about stress and how it affects us. That's aliveandwellstl.com. Alive and Well STL is another positive production of Rare Gym Productions. Thanks for listening.